So how, how many archaeologists, Chris, do we have in the United States? Mm, roughly 10,000. Around 10,000 archaeologists. So we're a little bit bigger. So and we're we're, we're still counting. Um, we're going to do something slightly different. Uh, we're going to talk about how training happens, or as you will see from our discussion, does not happen in the United States for building competencies as professional archaeologists. So what uh, Chris and I are going to start doing is we're going to talk about how the perspective that we have from as the Register of Professional Archaeologists, who I'll define what that register is in a minute, and we'll talk about the state of the states, what's going on, and then how the register has taken on uh, since I became president last year, and then Christopher continuing as president-elect uh, for the next two years, starting in 2018, is to step into the breach. Because, as you all saw, there's this incredible gap in terms of a lack of training that is not happening in the United States, which is affecting the quality of the work and also the perception of, you archaeologists are a pain in the butt, you're stopping our projects because you don't have the training or the competencies to do so. <clears throat> so we're going to kind of take that approach. Um, so first of all, thank you, Kate, for having us here. Uh, and I just want to mention for the folks who don't know anything about the Register of Professional Archaeologists, we're kind of like CIFA, but kind of not. Um, the Register uh, is a listing. We do not have members. We have registrants. We're a listing of professional archaeologists in the United States and in other countries. We have like 95 in Canada. We have, I think, 19 here in the UK, and then it's scattering around the, around the world. And to become a registered professional archaeologist, what you do is you publicly declare that you will do your work as a professional archaeologist following a explicit code of conduct and standards of research performance. And their standards talk about how you do archaeological work in the context of your relationship to the archaeological record, your relationship to your employer, be it a university, a commercial archaeological firm, a museum, and also your relationship to the, Amer the public. So that's how the standards of research performance are laid out. And we promote this professionalism by certification to becoming registered professional archaeologists, RPAs. We also have a grievance process so that anybody in the United States or anybody where there's an RPA working, like a member of the public, can file a grievance against a registered professional archaeologist because they have violated the code of conduct or the standard of research performance. In addition, if a registered professional archaeologist is falsely accused, which has happened, archaeologists are very nice to each other, of course, they're not <laughs> falsely accused, their colleagues do they? So when that happens, then we have their back. And so we'll demonstrate, we've looked at the code, we've looked at the, the case, they have not violated, thank you very much. So we support the registers uh, from these kinds of, of attacks. And also, we uh, certify uh, continuing professional education, CPEs or CPDs here in, in the CFN in the UK, and we also certify field schools. So that's kind of what the register does. Um, to become a registered professional archaeologist, you have to have an advanced degree, master's at the minimal or a PhD. Uh, and the reason why, it's an historical reason why in the United States, because the, we have one national standard for a professional archaeologist, and this is the Secretary of the Interior, which is the uh, kind of the land managing federal agency with the United States, and their regulation says you must have a master's degree to do archaeological work recognized by the U.S. government. So we had to match that level. So when we did that through uh, the history of the register for many years, we have a lot of folks who have a bachelor's degree who are very qualified, but we couldn't bring them in because we were linking it with the national standard set by the Secretary of Interior. That may change, and we'll talk about that uh, going forward. So uh, you have to have a master's degree, and then you also have to have demonstrated that you've done substantial archaeological research. And this could be while you have your degree, or we've changed our regulations now, and you can have it after your degree. So that's how you become a registered uh, professional archaeologist. So, but before I begin, I, 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 we have to say that uh, Chris and I are basically giving you our opinion, so we have to have this little caveat. We do not represent the opinion of the board of the Register of Professional Archaeologists <laughs> or the Register. This is just our opinion, but we think that the board and our colleagues will actually get to where we're going. So that's kind of the background. So, so like in the United States, as we heard this morning, uh, where does the training happen? Same place, in academia, in the universities. The problem is, is that when you get a bunch of commercial archaeologists or commercial firm owners, they start whining. 
you know, hire these people from these universities, they got a master's degree or PhD, and they know nothing. And so, and you hear this, you know, it sounds very familiar. Uh, and so it's, this seems like it'd be like a, a kind of a worldwide issue here. And they don't have the skills that needs to be done in terms of a non-academic uh, situation. So I'm going to use this slide for different reasons. So what we've done, we looked at, well, what are the skills in the United States that you need to have? Uh, there's the uh, technical skills, which is the dirt archaeology. How to dig, how to survey, how to inventory, how to record, how to analyze artifacts, how to map, um, how to do analyses and data management. Right? Then we have the non-technical skills or soft skills, and these are things like being able to communicate with your peers, with the public, and particularly in the United States with descendant communities, with Native Americans. Uh, or in Hawaii, Native Hawaiians or Native Alaskans, having that ability to communicate what you're doing and to hear what their needs are when you do your archaeological project. Also being able to work as a team, to be able to write technically as opposed to academically doing a 300,000 word, yeah. amazing, <laughs> PhD. Okay, to be able to write things that people can understand technically. Uh, so that's a kind of another soft skill. Um, to be able to think critically. This is another argument we hear all the time. People come out of the universities, they cannot problem solve. They don't know how to do a critical analysis of the site that they have been given uh, through no fault of their own, saying you dig the site and do an analysis. I think critically. So we're finding that the university students don't have that skill to think critically and technically. Um, so those are kind of the non-technical skills. And linked with that is the subject matter areas, which is understanding the history and the culture of the area that you're working in. Uh, so that's another kind of soft skill. And then there's the regulatory legal skills. This is understanding the laws and regulations which are the underpinnings for commercial archaeology in the United States. So, and there's also state laws and also local laws, but mostly it's at a federal level, so understanding those things. And then a new one that's really been growing is administrative. This is the ability to be a business manager in any context be it in an anthropology department, archaeology department, be it at a commercial firm, being at an agency to be able to do business management, budgeting, proposals, human resources, et cetera. So these are the skills that we uh, think that archaeologists in the United States have. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have all of them, but at least these are the different tracks that exist in the United States, given where our discipline is going. So. But as we've shown here, that there are some gaps. And it's also interesting in terms of who does what. In terms of, let's do university versus, which is the green. Obviously, subject matter experts. You know, you learn how to do the archaeology of Northeast United States or, you know, Chakwin archaeology of the Southwest. So it's really focusing on the culture, history, and the archaeology and what's been done and the research questions. The universities do a very, very good job about that. Where they do very poor, job is on the technical side. That, they don't seem to do that very much anymore in the United States in terms of the actual mechanics of digging, surveying, documenting analysis. They're doing that a lot less. Uh, the regulatory legal side, there, uh, there's a few universities that are beginning to talk more about the legal underpinnings of what we do in terms of compliance archaeology in the United States. But the practitioners have usually are not the ones who have a lot of experience in doing it outside of academia, or they were outside of academia for a short while, and now they're teaching. So, but they don't, aren't really true practitioners. And then the non-technical stuff, how to write technically, how to work as teams, how to critically think, communicate, that is also something that's not being done at the universities. So where do they get it? OK, the technical side basically comes mostly out of the field schools, which is the purple which has now become very problematic in the United States, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and on the job. That's where the most of the technical skills are now happening in the United States. It's on the job, be it at a commercial firm or at an agency or, or, or someplace else. The legal regulatory side is mostly now on the job, though that has also become problematic. And that's where they learn, because they're doing it, the archaeological work, in the context of the legal requirements. And the non-technical, to be able to write, to communicate, it's like you're training these people from universities all over again in your firm or your agency. So that's where that happens. And the administrative side is totally, totally within the on-the-job uh, situation. So that's kind of 
what's going on in terms of, and then we have the gaps, because still it has, even where the training is now available, it's not being filled all the way up to the top to 100%. So even with the, the institutions and organizations we have, it's still not getting to meeting the needs of the archeological work in the United States. So we have these gaps um, and we're asking questions now, given this, the register is asking this question, as is the American Cultural Resource Association, which is, I guess, your equivalent to fame here in the UK, which is the kind of a consortium or a trade association of commercial firms. Uh, as opposed to stop whining about it, we want to do something about it. So what we want to do is we're now thinking about, okay, what's the appropriate role of universities? What's the appropriate role of on-the-job training? Are there other venues for training? of professional archaeologists, and if there are, what are they? Do we have to create them? Do they, are they out there already? We don't know about them, or do we have to create them out of whole cloth? While we're having this discussion, fortunately or unfortunately, some rather dramatic things are happening with the United States, which is not the current administration, which I will not talk about. So, um, this is being recorded. All right. Okay, so um, this is kind of based on Chris and Ryan's uh, working with government agencies, universities, associations, uh, the professional societies around the country. And what we're finding out is that archaeologists are retiring at a dramatic rate. And we saw the thing, I guess, from the, in Japan, where there's this now crisis in terms of everybody is aging and then who's coming behind them. So we're experiencing right now a great exodus of people who have been in the field for decades who are now leaving. So we have this uh, increasing retirement every single year. And when agencies in the, on the public side do actually fill these positions, they're hiring very young professionals because they can't afford the experienced people because their budgets are being cut, both at the federal and at the state level and at the local level. They can't afford to hire a, qual a highly qualified older person. They hire a young individual who has no experience with what they're being tasked to do, particularly in terms of the <laughs> regulatory side, the administrative side, and the technical side. They're real green. So that becomes a, a big problem. And we're also finding that retirement flow out also happening with the commercial firms. So there's a, a big discussion going on now in terms of, of uh, whether the firms, in terms of succession planning, who's going to take over the firms, and then how to fill the gaps between them. So that is also a big issue. Um, and so what this chart shows is kind of the bigger picture. This is from the uh, U.S. Uh, Office of Personnel Management, which is looking at uh, federal retirements. And the trend is very similar to what I just talked about that Chris and I have seen based on our experience. In particular, at starting at uh, 2009 and 2010, it has dramatically increased into the retirement. So this is a national trend that we're going to be have to be dealing with going forward. Okay. Shift to B, this work? Ah, good. Okay. Um, so, what's interesting, particularly with the commercial firms, yes, you okay? Okay. With the commercial firms, um, is that they're, they're hiring all these new individuals, and what's really kind of sad is that they don't have the skills to understand why are they doing archaeology. You know, they, they know how to dig. They know how to record, but they don't understand what's the legal ramification. So when they produce a product, it doesn't help the, their customers, who are the federal agencies or the state agencies, in terms of what they're getting. Um, I recently uh, was asked by a state highway department in, uh, in the Southwest to come to teach a class to their consultants because the agency was sick and tired of teaching the commercial archaeologists who they hired and paid to understand what the laws and regulations that guide their work. So I started off the class and I said, okay, how, how many of you have taken a class in the laws and regulations that I was going to teach and have actually had experience? And this was a room of about 30 people, mostly commercial archaeologists. Two people raised their hands, which was very sad. And these included a room of junior and unfortunately a lot of senior archaeologists. So they didn't understand the basic underpinnings of why they did what they did. Uh, which then the product that they produce is not going to address the needs of the individuals who need the data and the work and the research that they do. So this is a, a, a becoming a, a big and growing problem in the United States. Now on the field school side, what's also happening 
sadly, is uh, at the last American Cultural Resource Association uh, meeting uh, last fall, um, we began to see that the number of field schools are decreasing at universities. And I don't know what's happening here in, in the UK and in Europe. Um, and the reason why universities are cutting back because they're afraid of the liabilities. The lawyers are taking over. So they don't want to have the liabilities. Also, the costs, because a lot of the universities, particularly the state-run universities, their funding is being cut by government. So now they have to find the money someplace else, so they get it on the backs of the students through tuition. So now, as a result, the students cannot afford to go to field schools. So they're not getting the field experience. So this is kind of like a double whammy that's going on. Uh, which has been very, very bad. So you've got the problems with the training, coming out of the school, not understanding the legal side, and then the field schools are slowly, but slowly disappearing. And then I'm gonna pass this on to Chris for one more. I'm gonna show you what's kind of happening in terms of the, where the need is going, going forward. And this is from the US Department of Labor statistics on archeological employment. So this is archeological employment, both in academia and the commercial sector and agencies. So what this chart, in, in terms of numbers you're showing, is that the replacement of the retirement requires about 1,500 archeologists per year. So this is just for the retirement. So 1,500 archeologists per year need to be replaced. In addition, there's about 200 to 400 new positions that have to be filled. So there's a concern then with this growth, which is a, like a 4% growth, that there's gonna be a problem down the road in terms of not meeting the needs of the archeologists, okay? So now I'll pass it on to Chris, which is going to provide a, a more views of what's going on. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So why do we have a dilemma in, in training and education in the United States? So over the last about 40, 45 years, we've seen pretty much a complete transformation or flip in archaeology from a, almost a complete public archaeology done by archaeologists in academia, museums, and in government to an archaeology that's done almost exclusively now by private for-profit firms. And we can look at the, the chart here by dollars. So today, uh, at least by dollars spent, there's only a, it's, it's an immaterial amount of money that's not done by the, by the private sector. So and our forecasts are uh, in 2018, we'll hit the billion dollar a year mark in archeological spending. In terms of traditional grant money for research, which mostly funds the academic uh, projects, some other projects, it's about $25 million a year. So it's, you know, in terms of this chart, it's barely even even on the scale. And with numbers of peoples, people, we estimate that there's roughly uh, 10,000 professional archeologists in the United States. And, and Kenneth can attest as well, it's, you, know, you have much, much better data here in the, the UK on, on the archeology span itself, but also on the, the project coming in. Surprisingly, we have pretty poor data, but roughly 10, 11,000 professional archeologists and about 82% of them today work outside of academia. This change started happening in 1966. We had a federal law that was passed called the National Historic Preservation Act. And more importantly, it was 1974 when the implementing regulations for that uh, were written. And so it was about that time, mid-70s, that the whole private archaeology began. And as the private sector grew, the skills that were needed to be a successful professional archaeologist started to diverge from the skills that were needed to be an academic archaeologist. While academic institutions training archaeologists certainly recognized that there, were, there was a new skill or new skill sets uh, developing and that were needed, they were very, very slow and reluctant to respond to, that, to those training needs. Um, they, they understood that, but just felt that, that our job is not to, to train people for jobs. Our job is to train people about the science of archaeology and, and archaeology. So the uh, a gap began to, uh, to develop. And really, it's only been about the last 10 years that we have seen programs in, the, in universities in the United States that are focused on applied archaeology. But it's only roughly 20 um, 
20 programs, and those have pretty much all come online in the last 10 years. So there are a couple notable exceptions, but for the most part, it's 20 programs, and I'll show you what they're teaching here in a, in a second. Um, and that's out of, we have about 100, over 140, about 140, 150 programs in the United States that, that give master's degrees in archeology, span so quite a few. Most of those programs in, in university programs, including the ones that are applied oriented, uh, don't use what, what we at least call kind of a professional school model, right? So other disciplines that produce lots of applied um, professionals, so within the social and behavioral sciences, psychology, sociology, um, you know, and then the things like medicine and law and architecture, right? They have a very different model for, for training students. And it's a program that takes in lots of people with not too much screening on the outside and it's very skill oriented uh, in its, its training. It's really kind of training people to have the skills to practice professionally. Archaeology doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, the, the reasons why are because the kind of the historical roots of archaeological training within the universities but also because of the, the knowledge set that's required to be, a, be an archaeologist, right? We need to know a little bit about all kinds of things and a lot about a few things. So within the United States, typically, uh, Terry already mentioned, a master's degree is the academic requirement, and that typically takes two to three years of studies in a program, in an archaeology program, that's typically within an anthropology department, although there are some that, that are not. With that training, we do a pretty good job of, of training scholars, and archaeologists stack up pretty well um, to other other scholars in terms of their background and training. It's very you know traditionally academic, very theoretical. We have a good understanding of our, our field. We make good scholars, um, but we we don't make with that training really good practitioners. Universities are, are very reluctant to change the curriculum because it already takes three years to, to produce, in their view, a competent uh, archaeologist. And they won't deviate from the curriculum to swing over to a kind of a skill-based professional training program. And so there's no room, really, within the, what they've used the required curriculum to bring in more types of training and, and the skills that we feel are necessary to be a competent professional archaeologist. They also can't lengthen and expand the program because academic programs are under more and more scrutiny by administrators within the university to get students through very quickly and get them out there on the job market, even though they may not have the, the skills for that. <laughs> so they're, they're stuck in this, this jam where they won't change their, the content of the curriculum and they are, are loath to kind of expand it or constrained to, to expand it to include things that are necessary, even though they recognize that those are, are needed. But they view that as the responsibility of the future employer to teach those students the skill. Their job is to teach about archaeology. So what happens to that, that master's student then who completes their degree and, and goes out for their job interview in a private company? Well, discussion about the content of their degree, about archaeology itself, itself, is minimal. Okay, it's pretty much, there might be a few questions, five minutes, what'd you do, where'd you go? But the fact that they have that master's degree is really, is a good indicator that they really know about archaeology. What the employer, of course, cares about is do you have the skills to do archaeology? Do you have the skills to practice archaeology? And of course, they have very few. So uh, job interviews are, are really focused on assessing does the archaeologist have the skills to really do the job that, in, that the private firm, which is most often where this interview is, is are they willing to invest in that employee? How much are they going to have to put in to really get the skill development up to a point where they're a viable employee in a private uh, private for-profit archaeology. So the and the, and the the employment track for somebody typically in the United States in a private commercial firm uh, with a master's degree really is towards a project manager position. And you know those of us who have all done that know that that you know if you're an active project manager in a commercial firm. You rarely do hands-on archaeology. 
you know, the skills that you need to do that job. And it's a tough job from a, from a economic perspective within the company. It's one of the most critical positions in terms of the company being, being viable financially. But it's also just a very challenging job to begin with. And the skills you need, you know, in that position, you manage, you coordinate, you communicate, you team build, you market, and, you know, you run, run those projects. So those are the skills that the private companies have to invest in. And typically it takes one to two years of on-the-job training um, for that new kind of graduate to get to understand those skills and start to develop those skills and turn into a competent employee at a junior level still as a junior project manager, but at least they have the basic skill set to be, to be competent. So because when they came into the company initially, they didn't have that skill set on the market, they weren't, they weren't valuable, and didn't provide much value to that company. So because they didn't have the skill set, they couldn't command a very high billing rate to clients. Therefore, the company couldn't compensate and pay that archaeology very much. Well, a couple of years later, that archaeologist has developed that skill set, and they're now very marketable on, on the, the market and can command, command a much higher salary. And often what happens at that point is that that employee leaves and goes and takes a, a higher paying job with a, another firm. Um, and that, that firm is happy to get that person because they don't have to invest in the, in the training. So what happened then to that company's investment, they basically lost two years of real investment and in training and never really recouped that back. So from the company point of view, the commercial side, they're pushing back to academia and to universities and saying, no, the training needs to be you know, on, on your side. You need to get archeologists the skills that they need to be viable in our marketplace today. And universities are going, no, 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 that's not our, not our job. So within North American archaeology today, that's really why we have this skill gap, this divide, so that people are falling into between the world of academia and learning about archaeology and between the kind of on-the-job side and learning about the skills that you actually need to practice archaeology as a professional. And I'm going to hand it back here to Terry to, to finish up. We always are thinking Paris in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, there are some. You hear me okay? Okay. There are some uh, shining stars out there, and, this, and Chris alluded to this. We have a few applied master's programs. Uh, and what's interesting is that a lot of the universities, well, the, the few, the, the 20 that do this, have taken on a really business capitalistic view. They look at students as their customers. And so they are thinking about getting their customers the education that they need to be able to get a job. And it's out of uh, you know, 150 programs, we're only talking about a handful. And so what these applied programs focus on is practice and ethics. They actually, oh my god, teach classes about archaeological ethics, which is absolutely amazing. You know, as a president of the register, that my little heart goes pity pat when you hear that. <laughs> archaeological theory, the whole process and the practice of archaeology and methodology. Actually teaching research and writing, critical thinking, and thank God about compliance and the laws and the regulations. So they have that understanding, and then less so going down. Uh, the Bono one is now beginning to get uh, more and more uh, applied in some programs to work with particularly Native Americans in terms of understanding the cultural differences and how we have to interact with them as archaeologists because we are dealing with part of their record. So this is what's going on with the applied programs, and we have a few shining stars. But over, jump, jump yeah. in, Terry, too. I mean, an interesting thing about this this graph was remember there are the, the 150 programs. This represents the, the 20 or so that are only teaching the real applied tracks. But so while you know it's encouraging that some of them are teaching some of the things that we think are important skills. Look at the percent, and these are required classes. Look at all the white space on that, that graph. You know, and that's really disturbing if these are the, the focused applied programs and they're not teaching, you know, only half or less are teaching about re research and writing, legislation compliance methods, et cetera, et cetera, down the list. So while there are some really good things like about practice and ethics, it's also a little disturbing that there's so much white space on that graph. And the other, you know, the 140, 50 programs you know, are, are teaching none of really none of these skills at all. And what's interesting, particularly uh, disturbing, is that the square for regional history, prehistory, and environment is really small at some of these places. There are universities, particularly in my state of New Mexico, where some of the most predominant universities do no studies 
or understanding and teaching of the archaeology of the state in the region. They're doing stuff in Belize, Peru. Okay, so then they're training these folks to do archaeology outside the United States, which is very problematic in terms of what's happening around the world, but not building that core of people who become subject matter experts within the archaeology. Two minutes. Okay, so, um, so the register is then moving on to, to determine to fill the gaps uh, in terms of what we're going to do to how to fix this problem. So one of the things that we're going to do to start filling these gaps and to address these issues, uh, the register is going to work with the so existing societies to build a bridge between all the different societies, Society of American Archaeology, Historical Archaeology, other organizations, and they have these committees that are working with the universities to work on the university's curriculum. But what we're going to do is they're not working together, so we're going to be doing a bridge with them to build those kinds of organizations. We're also beginning to look at other non-academic venues. And what's interesting, some entrepreneurs, archaeological entrepreneurs, are filling the breach by actually taking on the training of the technical skills for field uh, archaeologists uh, at the lower level and moving up, where they will actually go through a, develop a training program. These individuals will get trained, and they get a certificate and demonstrated that they have this technical skill. So they're filling the gap of where the universities are not providing them, and the field schools are disappearing. And they're going to be expanding these programs. So these entrepreneurs are doing some really interesting stuff that we're going to be teaming with them at the register. We're also going to plan on developing a task force to define greater archaeologists like myself and Chris who want to mentor young archaeologists. So we want to have a formalized mentoring program to help young professionals build a path to professionalism in terms of, well, what do I do and how do I become a professional archaeologist? We also want the register to become a clearinghouse for how do I get these different skills going forward if I want to become a public archaeologist and, and working for a federal agency, or I want to run a public archaeology program in a state, which there are some. Well, what do I have to do to get those skills? So the register is going to collect all this information, working with the societies and the universities and other organizations saying, this is where you go to get this information so you can say, what, what do I have to do to get on this track to forward my career? And in, the last thing we propose to do is to go ahead and actually shape the curricula at universities the best way we can with these applied programs and other programs by certifying university programs. So the goal here then is to kind of shift right now, uh, as we said at the beginning, we focus on you've got a master's, you have a substantial research interest, you're a registered professional archaeologist. We're thinking we want to go to a different way because archaeology in the US uh, like it sounds like in other parts of the world, is divergent. You've got different tracks. You've got the peer re, uh, research archaeologists, the traditional. You have the administrative archaeologists, someone working in an agency uh, and policies, and then uh, working with the public and public sector. So what we want to do is to, you know, it, this looks familiar for these folks in CIFA, starting off with an apprenticeship uh, registered uh, archaeologist, which we don't have, to maybe becoming an RPA, and then which will be kind of a common core and then you could diverge in becoming a master RPA. So we, we're going to copy what CIFA is doing maybe to see if it works uh, in the United States. So this is kind of where we think we're going to be going uh, in terms of getting away from the academic focus on the masters and the problems that we've been talking, Chris and I have been talking about, to more of a skill-based competency evaluation to help people become truly professionals in each of those areas. So thank you very much for having us here. Thank you.